Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome back to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week on the podcast, we have Matt Zeeler, founder and CEO of Clarify, one of the first startups to apply modern deep learning for image recognition. Clarify's AI tools serve customers such as Staples, OpenTable, and the U.S. Department of Defense. Matt discusses the challenges of competing against industry giants like Google, the benefit of network effects by being a central hub for data, NVIDIA's software advantage in AI acceleration, and why applying AI in a defense setting is good for America. Clarify, I followed AI for a while now, and you know, it struck me Clarify was one of the first AI companies in the new kind of deep learning era. Right. AlexNet came out in 2012, and I think you incorporated in 2013. So really the first wave of kind of this generation of AI companies. Mm -hmm. What gave you the insight to start Clarify in the first place? Yeah. So even as a kid, I always wanted to start a company. And I think that was because of my upbringing in a small farm town outside of Winnipeg in Canada. And there was no real tech there. So it was always inspiring to see that on TV. And I knew deep down that someday I wanted to start a company because I think that's a way you can have a really big impact on the world. And so I didn't know where that would be or what that company would do until I was really in my PhD. And my PhD was focused on understanding images using artificial intelligence. And given the research I was doing, I knew it was going to be a big opportunity to start a company because I did a couple internships at Google, uh, actually in their AI team called Google Brain in 2012 and 2013. Was that Mountain View or here yeah, in New York? Yeah, I went over okay. to Mountain View and I realized in that I learned a lot from all the engineers there and a lot about the use cases they were using AI for internally. And I knew that Google was already in the lead in terms of like commercializing this technology within Google itself. But I saw that as an opportunity to take my research, which I knew was working better than what Google had internally, and bring that technology to other companies out there. And so that was really the genesis of Clarify. Gotcha. And who did you study on your PhD, on your PhD program? Yeah, so both my undergrad and my PhD, I happened to learn from some of the pioneers of AI. So at University of Toronto during undergrad, I did work with Jeff Hinton, who a lot of people consider the godfather of AI. And he's been working on these problems since the 70s and 80s. And I was very lucky to actually just by chance, run into one of his PhD students after my second year of the engineering science program. It's a pretty cool program because you take every discipline of engineering for the first two years, and then you have to specialize. When I was about to decide on my specialty, I ran into, his name was Graham, and he showed me this video of a flame flickering, and he said it was completely generated by artificial intelligence. That's what really got me hooked, got me introduced to Jeff Hinton, and I ended up doing my undergrad thesis with Jeff, which was quite the honor because it was the first time he's taken an undergrad for wow. a thesis project. And that's where I got my taste of AI, but I didn't know enough. And that's why I did my PhD so I could learn enough about AI to start a business around it. And I decided on NYU because of two really good professors there, Rob Fergus, who was big in the computer vision field, and Yan Nakun, who was uh, another one of these pioneers who has been working on AI since the 80s. And uh, I mentioned these names because they've since gone on from the academic community to the commercial world. So Jeff Hinton has gone on to join uh, Jeff Dean to run Google AI. Yan LeCun and Rob Fergus have gone on to Facebook to lead their AI efforts. So it was really exciting to learn from them in the academic community and now uh, compete with them <laughs> out in the commercial community. And those are really the, the grandmasters of modern AI. 
You mentioned that you worked on an AI algorithm while interning at, at Google that better than their internal version. Like A, how is that possible given their tri vast resources? And B, did you show them this work or how does that even work? Yeah, it was really the algorithms I was working on at NYU that I could see were working better than what Google had. And I think there's an opportunity for any independent researcher to have a lot of really good ideas because there's two main components to making AI good. There's data, high quality and high quantity data, but then there's the algorithm. And that's where an independent researcher can have a lot of uh, leeway to design and innovate a new algorithm that can solve a problem better. And so that's a lot of the innovations that come from academia are on the algorithm side because they don't have access to large amounts of data or different data sets. So that's what I was doing at NYU, innovating on the algorithm side. And I could see that if I scale it up with data, there'd be a big commercial opportunity for this. Gotcha. And just to nerd out a bit, like was Google's version basically Inception and, and the one that you were working on at NYU, the, like, did it have a name? So at that time, it was really AlexNet. I see. 2012, like you mentioned, is when AlexNet uh, came out. Uh, and that was kind of the first real large scale neural network for computer vision that really showed a lot of promise. And then everything from there kind of was innovations on that. So later we published a variant of what became Clarify and we called it ZFNet, or I think the community really did for Zeller and Fergus, my PhD advisor. It was really our publication together in the fall of 2013. And then the model that Clarify actually uh, leveraged off the start was an even better variant of that. Okay, awesome. Clarify is now a seven-year-old company. Um, you're based in New York. How have you done in the last seven years? Maybe you can tell us about your customers, like who are they today and, and how do they use your products? What products do you offer as well? Yeah, so starting the company with core research, we had to figure out how do we get this into people's hands. And that's when the idea of opening it up as an API came about because we wanted to give developers a very simple interface to send us an image and we tell you what's in it. And so uh, that was the initial product that we offered starting in 2014. And now it's expanded in a lot of different dimensions. So we introduced video support coming in 2015. We were the first vendor to allow you to upload a video. And in that case, we give you a whole time series of information back from it. And that's kind of when we started getting our first customers, uh, some in the stock media space to organize stock photos, some of them in even wedding space uh, to uh, organize and tag uh, wedding blog content so that they could serve better ads next to it. So when you're planning your next uh, or your, your wedding, you can get inspirations from that. Uh, and then longtime customers like Travago in the travel space, they organize hotel listings using our technology that can recognize pool or bedroom or lobby or, you know, beach, that kind of stuff. So when you're planning your next vacation, you can search and find hotels that match uh, your criteria. And that's kind of been the organization use case, which we started with. Now we've introduced a whole suite of different use cases. We can perform visual search so people can upload an image and find visually similar content automatically. So West Elm was a customer in this space where they've indexed their product catalog with Clarify. And now a user can take pictures from Pinterest and upload them to this tool that they provide that allows you to find furniture that West Elm sells that match your preferences. So that's an idea of visual search applied to e-commerce space. And now more recently in the last couple of years, we have a large footprint in public sector as well, working with the Department of Defense and doing a lot of different applications there from kind of surveillance and security applications to even natural disaster recovery. Gotcha. I'd love to go back, you know, follow up with the government stuff, because I think it's such an interesting area and, and very topical right now. But there are many applications for artificial intelligence. You seems like Clarify is focused on the computer vision only component. Is that right? Do you offer language or, or voice recognition tools? So it's been a long time since I founded the company and we founded really on the computer vision aspect, but now we're starting to look into other areas that we can expand into. And those include natural language processing. We're getting excited about that and looking at opportunities there. Uh, data annotation as well is a really important part of the AI process. Like labeling? Yeah, labeling data. So we're looking at ways to make that really efficient. And then we're going to consider other areas like audio and other types of data in the future as well. 
well. So hopefully throughout the next couple of years, we'll get into those areas. Do you find customers today, like in terms of revenue, is it mostly concentrated in some large enterprise companies? Is it more like a lawn tail or is it like government taking an increasing share? What, what does that look like? It's really a mix. There's some large enterprise customers, large government customers, and then this long tail of self-serve users. And those are typically a mix of SMBs and mid-market companies that sign up for Clarify. We have a free tier where you can sign up, not even swipe a credit card. And we want that because we want people to start trying the products and figuring out how it fits into their business problems. And a lot of people can then just upgrade with their credit card and start paying us and do that month over month. That is a good lead funnel for our sales team to engage with them and figure out their bigger problems and how we can work with uh, the larger enterprises directly. But because of that kind of free tier and self-serve funnel, we do have a long tail of, of smaller businesses as well. How has the market size and the reception of your customers been relative to your initial expectations? Some we tend to see the markets are so large, everyone is growing together. Some there's just like intense competition from the large scale players like Amazon and Google that, that it tends to be a highly competitive industry. And it's more not fully zero sum, but definitely a lot of bidding wars going on. Mm -hmm. What's your experience been for Clarify? So being one of the first deep learning AI startups, uh, we saw the true early adopters early on. And we've seen this huge wave where there was a bunch of small companies who would read about AI, get excited about it and try out ideas. And now we're starting to see that change into larger organizations actually understanding the value that those early adopters started to see. And so we're having conversations with large airlines, for example, right now, talking all the way up to the CIOs about solving really big problems they have with logistics and uh, maintenance and that kind of stuff throughout their organizations. And those conversations didn't exist five years ago. Airlines, and I'm just using airlines as one example industry, but um, the large organizations like an airline just weren't uh, having conversations with any AI vendor. It wasn't on their radar. It wasn't in their budgets. And so now that's completely changed. And that includes the government as well. I think the government's caught on to the real value in AI and how it can automate processes and save money and, and drive revenue. So it's really exciting time. When you have these conversations, I'm sure they're asking kind of, we're, we're trying you, we're trying Azure, we're trying Amazon. Why should we choose a startup over some company? Like you can't get fired for buying IBM. You probably can't get fired for, for buying AWS. Like what would you say is your chief competitive advantage versus kind of the, stat, the larger vendors? It's pretty simple. We don't compete with you. And I think that's a huge problem with these trillion dollar companies is that they're going to compete with you in some way or another. So for example, retail is a big industry for us. You have Amazon on one side who obviously is directly competing with you and taking more and more of your business daily. You have Google shopping within Google's suite of products and Microsoft serves up shopping traffic, but also has deep partnerships with people like Walmart, who you're probably competing with as well. So all three of the tech giant choices you have for AI APIs are going to compete with you. Whereas Clarify, we don't compete with our customers. We want to be seen as that partner that is going to take your data, learn from it to solve your business problems together. And that's why the government has been so uh, such a good partner too. They see us as that, that true partner. I was literally down in DC yesterday with our one of our largest customers from the DOD brainstorming about uh, a future project and how we should tackle it from an AI perspective. And that's a big value that they get, not only from you know, a PA PhD in AI, but the CEO of a company. So I can change the whole direction of the company tomorrow if we need to for our large customers. You're never going to get that out of the tech giants. And the tech giants have really become our competitors over the last six years. Really three years ago, they started introducing APIs. We've seen other startups come and go over the years as well. And there's new AI startups every single day. But we were just mentioned in the Forrester uh, Computer Vision New Wave report and as a leader. And that was really exciting to see that we've been recognized as the only startup in the leadership position next to Google, uh, Microsoft, and Amazon. And we've kind of broken away from the startup path. And I think a big part of that is our approach to, to building a, a true AI platform. A lot of these AI startups are these kind of smaller niche players. They're trying to solve one problem. But when we are talking to the government and large enterprises, 
the CIOs are, are not thinking about one problem. They're thinking about how do we solve all these different problems that I have with as few vendors as possible, with as few different procurements as possible, and uh, really have a platform approach to it. And we've taken that from day one, build a platform for AI. And I think that we're starting to see that pay off. You mentioned APIs. You know, this is this is interesting. This is a, a kind of almost like a new business model that's become more the norm. Basically, when companies use these AI services, they're charged by you know, a fixed price per 1,000 images. Upload 1,000 images, you'll come back with 1,000 labels saying what they are. That's how you basically give them mm -hmm. value. How do you feel like this model is working? Like some, I've read some recent reports, like it seems like the amount of volume for API-based businesses, even for AWS, I think the information reported was on the order of single million dollars for them. Whereas the infrastructure cost of, of, of renting GPU servers and whatnot is, is there, that's a $10 billion per quarter business that, that just came out. Is, I guess, the API model, do you feel like there is good, is that a large market? Uh, is that the right consumption model have, in your experience or other new models that work better from a business perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think the perfect example and comparable is Twilio. Yeah. Uh, they kind of invented this model. All the public clouds have a similar usage-based model as well, but Twilio is doing it as a pure API. They're doing it more as infrastructure. And the and I met Jeff Lawson uh, several times over the years. We share common investors in Union Square Ventures. And one of the first things I learned from Jeff was you want to have the usage space pricing type of model because you want to really align with your customers. If they're a small customer, they're going to use a little bit, you're going to charge them a little bit, and you're aligned on value. But if they take off as a, you know, a new startup, a new area, we have no way of predicting that. But when they do take off, you're going to ride that wave with them. So there could be the next, you know, Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook out there that is going to have a massive amount of traffic. And if you truly provide value from day one and be that partner, like I was talking about, you can accelerate their business and that accelerates your business. And you offer both a rate for pre-trained models, which is to say categories you've already learned in your, you know, super neural net, um, as well as you al allow customers. You're one of the first companies to allow customers to train based on their own lab their That's own right. examples of, of data. Do you find most companies opt for the early, the, the former, which is just this a pre pre baked cake, if you will, or do most customers go for the we need custom labeling and custom data? Yeah, it's a great question. It's it's actually a mix of both because. In particular, a couple of our pre-trained models are more popular. Our general model is known to be the most accurate general purpose model. And this is useful when you're thinking about consumer photos or social media or stock photos where you don't really know what you're going to encounter. So you need a general purpose classifier. And that one that we provide uh, recognizes over 11,000 different things. The second most popular pre-trained model is our moderation model. And again, this is where you're, you don't know what's going to be uploaded to your site. And it could contain nudity, drugs, weapons, that kind of stuff that you want to filter out. And so those ones, you really don't need much customization because they're kind of generally applicable to a lot of different industries and use cases. Then you get into the customization that really matters on a company by company basis. So for example, recognizing your product catalog categories, that's very specific to each retailer or e-commerce site. They have a specific way of organizing their content and it has to be aligned with that. And so it's kind of a mix and, and some customers use a both at the same time. Um, an e-commerce marketplace where there's buyers and sellers uploading and exchanging content, you have to moderate that content, but you also have to organize it in your own vocabulary. For the customers that choose to kind of upload their own model, do they, d does Clarify own, uh, like benefit from more customers uploading their own data? Like, let's say I'm a, I don't know, a bookstore and I upload a bunch of books uh, with labels. Are you able to benefit from that customer data or is that kind of customer data private and only they get to use that, that experience? So in an anonymous way, we can actually benefit from it. So we don't share users' data with other users. That's kind of been our policy from day one. But we can take learnings from that data that can benefit other users. So for example, if a bunch of users are trying to recognize dogs, why don't we pool that data together to make a model that's much better at recognizing dogs than any one uh, customer would have if they only use their own data. That's a huge network effect. And this is why investors like Union Square Ventures, who have a thesis around network effects, got so excited about Clarify. Uh, there's a big network 
network effect of having more customers doing the same use cases on top of us. And that's one type of network effect. The other way uh, multiple customers benefit is through our expertise as well. We've seen the same problems over and over. This moderation use case, this product organization, visual search, you name it. Every use case we've seen from dozens of customers. And so when we see a new one, we can actually educate the customer like don't bother investing in this direction. It's not going to work. We've seen that before. Double down on this one. And so, again, it becomes that partnership where we're trying to solve a problem together. The general model you have has 10,000 categories. Is that constantly growing? How often are you retraining the, the general model? It is. And it's actually learning from the customer's data, which is really fun at this point. We have ways of collecting that stream of API calls that are being made from all of our customers and educating the models to get better over time. And we're actually building a, uh, a workforce to help annotate the data as like a human in the loop type of process so that we can uh, double check the model's predictions, make sure they're accurate, and that'll inform training of future model versions. And uh, that's an active project we're doing uh, in the first half of 2020, kind of scaling out this outsource work. And we're hoping to be able to provide some services around that to our customers uh, later in the year. Gotcha. Is there any limit to how large that model can grow? Can you just constantly add new new labels and new classes? Or do you kind of run into the capacity issues on the neural network? So it's interesting because in parallel to this explosion and excitement of AI has been corresponding explosion in computation power. And a lot of this is being driven by NVIDIA from their GPUs. And it's really what triggered this, the initial explosion of AI in the first place is the research community started using GPUs instead of CPUs. And overnight, I remember doing this myself at NYU, overnight there was a 30 times speed up. So my experiments that used to take a whole day would be done when I'm getting a cup of coffee. Uh, so that completely changed the field. And NVIDIA has kept up with this at least Moore's Law speed up year over year increase. And that has allowed researchers and and companies like Clarify to continue to grow the capacity of the models. And so that allows us to train models that can recognize more things, recognize them more accurately, and learn from a huge amount of data continuously. Gotcha. Are you still using the ZFNet architecture or have you switched to something else? No, we've continued to innovate. And actually, since about two years into the company, we, we started building a dedicated research team. And that's comprised of PhD students, master's students who have true AI backgrounds. And so they're responsible for innovation on that algorithm side, like I was talking about earlier. And so we have very unique algorithms that aren't published. They're not in the academic community, but these researchers also leverage what is being published. So they, if there's a great idea we haven't thought of, we bring it into our toolkit, continue to iterate on it. When we apply it to real world data, a lot of the academic ideas don't work. So we have to fine tune them. And that gives us kind of a very unique uh, offering that we can bring to our customers. That's so interesting. I thought everyone would have just standardized on ResNets by now. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I think that's actually a danger in a lot of the you know, academic community. They have fixed size data sets. And then whenever an idea works, everyone kind of focuses on that. And then there's, it's like a, a kind of step function. Everybody kind of makes a big leap and then it kind of plateaus. So there's a little bit of a danger to, to everybody doing that around open source. Let's talk about, I guess, infrastructure for a bit, because compute is one of the key drivers for AI. Are you happy with what's available in the market right now? I mean, what kind of infrastructure do you use? Do you, do you have you built your own data center? You, you build your own servers? You just rent from the cloud? How, what, what decisions have you made? We have a mix of both our own cloud and cluster and the public clouds. And so we made the decision very early on, 2013 actually, I bought our first server that we wanted to run ourselves. And back then uh, it was an easy decision because there wasn't GPUs in the cloud. So we started actually across the river in New Jersey, we have a data center and that we use today um, still for training all of our models. And that's what the research team is developing these algorithms on. And that's allowed us to keep a very low amount of expenses on the infrastructure side for our research purposes. All of our customers are using one of the public clouds, and we're actually really independent of where we run. Uh, that's a big advantage that our customers get from us. We can run on AWS, on Azure, and we can even run on on-premise deployments, uh, including air-gapped deployments. So for example, our work with the DoD is not even connected to the internet, and that's a big advantage of this portability. And that 
I think I'm pretty happy with the the state of infrastructure from that perspective. And I think the big enabler there is things like Kubernetes, which is essentially a orchestration layer on top of Docker. And Docker basically keeps your code in a safe environment or a reproducible environment rather. And so Kubernetes allows us to lift up all of our different services and dump them into a different cluster. Now, I think there's a lot of exciting new stuff coming around AI specific chips. And that's where I think, you know, the GPUs will continue to grow at Moore's Law, but then there's going to be the step function again when people start introducing AI chips to the masses. And you're starting to see a few of these chips, but I think it's going to take some of the big players like NVIDIA to introduce the AI chips and really make the software around those chips equivalent to what they did around their their GPUs, uh, which is CUDA, is the environment. That is really the game changer. And that's what allowed NVIDIA to kind of get ahead from Intel and AMD and these more AI-specific computations. They have a really good software stack. So I think I wouldn't be surprised if NVIDIA launches AI chips and then builds that software stack around it. Like an AI ASIC, like the, all yeah. the startups right now. Yeah. I don't think they've ever mentioned that they're going to, but I would be shocked if they didn't. Hmm, interesting. A lot of people seem to feel NVIDIA's GPUs, especially in the data center, are just too expensive. That's why they've switched to you know using their gaming GPUs for pr- private clusters or like Tesla building their own. First a chip for the car, and now they're building a chip for training, which seems crazy for a car company, right? To build an AI training chip. Um, do you get the sense that NVIDIA is just price their GPUs very aggressively and and it's it's kind of like they're pricing it as if they're the only shop in town, which I guess right now they are. I mean, that is a danger with that big lead. I was just mentioning that they are kind of in control and they have the luxury to price at whatever they want. I think AMD has had a really big 2019 and a lot of new chips came out of them, both on the CPU and GPU side. So if they get smart around the AI software around their chips, then there might be some more competition there. Intel is doing a little bit of stuff, but I think they're pretty far behind from NVIDIA, to be honest. Even with the two acquisitions in Nirvana and yeah. more recently Habana, they're basically uh, they're trying to acquire their way to to success, and still they're they're not shipping any volume that I can tell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's what I gather as well. But yeah, I, I think pricing themselves out of, the, out of the market is kind of a danger too, especially for small startups. Like, it's hard to buy a five thousand dollar piece of hardware where you need four or eight of them per server. This is making that server like a, a big part of your fundraise and one of your big expenses compared to salaries even. So uh, that is a big danger for sure. I think the, the way they've priced it is for the government and for Fortune 500 companies. It just doesn't work at the smaller scale. I see. For Clarify, is it cheaper to be on-prem or cheaper to, to go to the cloud? So it depends on your volume, really. We have different rates for operations when you're running our software on-premise because we know it's cheaper because you're providing the machines. But in order to get on-premise from us, you need to be a large enterprise customer. Uh, We don't offer it because it's a lot of uplift for us to be able to deploy it onto your servers. Uh, We don't offer it as a self-serve product, for example. Let's talk about the labeling uh, business. You, you mentioned that as a potential new direction for you guys. It seems like the latest wave of startups to make noise around that have scaled really quickly. And, and it's the less sexy part of AI. It's labeling, which is what you need for supervised learning. Companies like Scale.ai and, and Labelbox are, are making you know, kind of uh, uh, some good progress there. What's happening? I guess this seems to be a, a large and recognized market, but also seems to be very much human labor driven. Humans have to draw boxes around things and label them. Where do you see the opportunity there? And what are you hoping to build for, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I can't go into too much about you know the upcoming roadmap, but I, the opportunity I think is to have one platform that can truly be the end-to-end life cycle of AI. And to date, we allow you to label data in our platform. We allow you to search over that data, then you can train on top of that data, and then it's all deployed. The model that you've just trained is deployed, and you can then use it. We even complete the loop where predictions from that model can form labeling automatically in kind of an active learning fashion. So all that is true today, but we want to 
leverage this uh, scalable human workforce as well to kind of uh, have a human in the loop to smooth out that process and allow our customers to do less and get more value from us. We've been doing that over the years, actually, for our larger customers with a workforce in-house, but we want to make that more scalable and to more customers. Recently, you've started doing more work with the U.S. government, and it's so funny, the political climate is so dicey around this. And I, I frankly don't quite understand. A decade or a generation ago, if you worked for Boeing and Lockheed, you were viewed as a good person. Um, but today, if you're working uh, for the US government on Project Maven or one of the surveillance kind of applications, uh, you're almost kind of put in the bad bucket. I mean, what has changed? Is there any reason to, is there any rational cause behind this kind of thinking? And I think Clarify has gone on record saying you will work with government contracts. And how did you come to that decision? Yeah, I mean, we're very proud of our work with the government and we really view it as a way to improve the operations in the battlefield and to ultimately save lives. And as I was down in DC just this week, I heard of a, another use case for AI where a plane crashed recently in the battlefield in a not safe area and they had to monitor, is there anybody going for the people who ended up crashing and surviving uh, so that they could protect them? And so. That's a great use of AI that directly resulted in saving those people, getting them out of dangerous way. And I think that's just one small example of the impact we can have with AI. And I honestly don't know why there is this such bifurcating nature to this work. One of the things we've focused on over the last year is building the culture around Clarify and having the right people at Clarify who are all really excited about solving these problems with people like the DOD. And that's been game changer. Now everybody is aligned, everybody's excited about this, everybody sees the value and the impact we can have. And we've actually grown a whole new office from scratch over the last year down uh, outside of Washington, DC. And there's uh, over 15 people down there already out of 70 of us total. So uh, super excited to be working with them. What is it like to work with government? I mean, it's working with enterprises. We, we have plenty of stories. We know how that works. Is the government procurement contract a very different? Um, what do they look for? Is, do, how quickly do they move? It's completely different and uh, <laughs> it's it's really interesting. There's pros and cons too, because I think they can be some of your best customers once you become a vendor on contract because you become that partner, they trust you, you become their trusted advisor, they refer you to other customers within the government because you're solving their problem. But there is some challenges in how they procure with small vendors like us. Typically, we have to go through another prime contractor and adhere to a bunch of regulations that are meant for contractors and not meant for you know startups and commercial customers and so it's a kind of a legal negotiation and battle over these types of things and then the the time it takes to go through all that process and for the customers to be able to get budget to fund these initiatives is a long process even can be into the years uh, multiple years long process because of funding cycles with the government so it can be kind of frustrating from that perspective but once you learn about the problems get on contract and start solving them it gets really exciting what do you think is the single most clear case um, that's so high value and, and obviously a good use case of AI for a government application that maybe people can hear and understand as why this is not, this is a good idea? Yeah, I mean, I, I always like to use the natural disaster recovery efforts. So let's say there's a hurricane and a whole environment is destroyed, the houses are destroyed and people are missing. How do you find them? Um, and time is critical there because these people are probably injured or they don't have food or clean water. You have to find them and it could be a large area. So flying drones and be able to spot where the people are is much quicker than any type of manual process could possibly be. And this applies to not just hurricanes, but tornadoes, floods, uh, forest fires. There's lots of different large scale natural disasters that AI can have a massive impact on. So we're super excited about those types of problems. You mentioned video as kind of an evolving application you're, you're um, using more and more. What is video like from, a, I guess, a computational workload perspective? Is it like 10x what, what image recognition would typically require? Is that kind of an interesting growth market or is it kind of adjacent to the image recognition market? 
No, I think it's a really exciting growth market and it kind of ties into your question about usage. Like if you think of a single video stream, that's probably 30 frames per second. So that's equivalent to 30 images every second going through uh, an AI model. So if you're counting that as an image, that's a lot of images. And so, uh, and that's just one stream. So if you have, you know, even a small like uh, retail store might have a bunch of security cameras, like a handful or 10 of them, that's a lot of uh, images um, to be able to process. So I think it's a big opportunity and it has to be paired with a big growth in computation to be able to handle that. And I think one of the things we're evaluating very heavily now is how to run closer to that data at the edge of the network. And I think new technologies like 5G coming out is exciting to pair with AI because we can get from the camera, which might not have any processing on the camera itself, to the nearest data center. It might not be a big region. It's an edge um, data center. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. An edge data center. And there might be thousands of those compared to like the whatever eight regions. I don't know how many AWS regions there are in the U.S., but uh, it's kind of those single-digit numbers, the thousands, and then do the processing locally and that on those edge data centers, and then respond back to an edge device very quickly. So that's something we're trying to figure out what parts of that we want to play in. But I think it's a really exciting time with 5G coming and the processors on edge devices like phones getting very capable. Are neural networks for video very different than the ones for image? Are they based on the similar architecture? What do they look like? Depends on the task, really. Uh, They can be very similar, and you just treat it it as a frame-by-frame processing. And that'll work for cases where the the time component isn't super important. Uh, And that might be like, I want to recognize whether a dog is in this video or not. It doesn't matter if the dog's moving. It's just a dog. So uh, the other type of use cases, maybe like action recognition, where you want to say, is this dog running or sitting? And uh, that's where you might need a temporal component, and that can change the architecture of the neural network itself. And then another use case is tracking. And this is something we're really excited about. We have some algorithms in use with customers today for tracking, where we can actually attach an identity to an object. We might not like know if it's a person, we might not know their name or a dog. We don't know the dog's name, but we know it's the same object and we can follow it through a space, through that uh, video feed. So this is really useful because if you're a retailer, you might actually care about your traffic patterns of customers walking through your store. Do they actually go to this advertisement you have in store? Do they talk to your customer service reps? Where do they walk through the store before they go to checkout? All these things are really important to understand your customers. And that's something that tracking enables. Are you still following the machine learning literature research closely? Yeah, yeah. And it's really interesting because with the research team, they become, for me as CEO, it's hard to keep up with all the literature because it's growing like crazy. But with the research team, they become the first filter. And so they actually bubble up the good papers, which is really handy for me because I get to stay on top of things, but only the relevant and good innovative work. What do you think is the most impressive or influential piece of literature in computer vision that you've seen in the last couple of years? That's a good question. Uh, There's been a few. I think one that I liked recently was an idea uh, from some researchers at Google about just training kind of nonstop on data, trusting the predictions of a model. And they showed that if you train on something like 300 million images, you can get accuracy better than uh, data that was labeled by humans. And that was really compelling because that's something that was uh, already on our Are those labeled thoughts. examples or? They're, no, th- so it's using predictions of a model to teach other models. And so if you have enough data, you can basically trust your existing model and it can make a new model even better. Yeah. Okay. Is it like using a GAN to train a classifier? No, just purely the predictions out of a model. So. So for example, if I, like with our general model is very capable, we can recognize dogs very well. And if we run that over lots of different pictures of dogs, a new model trained off of those predictions can actually become better at recognizing dogs because it's seen more of a distribution of data than perhaps the original model has. There's a lot of AI talk about US versus China. Do you think that's a valid lens to view the world? Have you seen do you feel any kind of competitive pressure or, or I guess any perspective where it's, it's really two countries having this AI race? I think it's real. Yeah. I, I think there's, and especially from the Chinese side, there's a big initiative for AI. 
And I think the U.S. side is finally realizing that they need to have a similar type of initiative. But for example, when I go to these research conferences to catch up on papers, one thing that's completely shifted over the last six years is the fraction of authors coming from U.S. versus outside the U.S., and now about 50, and I'm just estimating, but I would say 50% of the papers are coming from Chinese authors. So it's completely shifted from U.S. domination to kind of Chinese domination. And that's very interesting. And they're doing great work. Um, so that's one advantage they have. They, have, they now have a lot of researchers who are clearly doing great work. Second, even bigger advantage is they have the data. And that's coming from use cases like deploying face recognition and, and surveillance on security cameras all over in large cities. And because they have those deployed, they're getting so much more data than people in the U.S. have access to. And I think that's a huge advantage that allows them to continue to accelerate. And I think until a similar type of situation happens in the U.S., there's a big potential to fall far behind. Okay. Awesome. I'm going to go to the lightning round. These are just three questions we ask every guest who, uh, who joins us. The first one is, what advice would you give yourself if you could travel back in time five years? I think trust your gut. Uh, there's a lot of decisions you have to make as CEO, and you have to realize that most other people in the organization or people you're asking for advice just don't have the context that you have. And so a lot of times you have to trust your gut. What is the most loved or useful piece of software, third-party software used within your organization? So it's going to be funny to any of our employees hearing it, but I think the Atlassian products, Confluence and Jira, are great for collaboration at scale because they allow you to get notifications on things that are happening that you don't have to ask people for updates on. I think there's some improvements that need to be made around their products, but I think it's it's a game changer compared to Microsoft Office or Google Docs style of editing. And sitting from where you are now and you have a, you know, a particular point of view on the world, what change do you see coming that's going to influence the world in a big way that maybe most people don't quite appreciate yet? I mean, I think we're already starting to see the initial use cases of AI and we're starting to see them in everyday, everyday lives, but I haven't seen use cases that start understanding multiple different data points and different types of data together kind of holistically. And the example I like to use is in shopping, you go online, uh, you don't just look at the image and hit buy. Uh, you read the description, the title, the price, obviously. You look at user reviews and then you make a decision. And I think we haven't yet seen AI that's learning from all these different components to help provide value to retailers and the end user. So I think that's going to be huge when that starts happening. And that's why we're looking beyond computer vision. Okay. That's great. And maybe just an AI-specific question since, uh, since you're Matt Zeeler. Are you a believer that we will achieve artificial general intelligence? And if so, do you have a sense of timeline? I do, but I think it's like depends on how people define it. I really think that AI is going to be better than humans in so many different ways. And it's already better than humans in a lot of ways for very specific use cases. There's been experiments in, in radiology, for example, where doctors who have been practicing for decades are being outpaced by AI just because it gets to see more data than any one doctor could possibly see in their lifetime. And so those examples are happening. But combined with that fusion effect that I was just talking about from multiple different data types, that's going to be a necessary step before we can think about uh, artificial general intelligence. And and I think getting that right is still decades away. Decades. Okay, Matt, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.